Karen was a student here in uh, Louisville from 79 to 82, the MDiv level. She then went to Oxford and studied, and she was in England from 82 to 86. She then came back, and her spouse, Paul, uh, whom she met in England, and uh, she was on faculty with Glenn Henson, Bill Leonard, and Lloyd Allen, who joined a couple years after you. So they became the, the church history faculty at, at Southern, really right before the transition. And she was here from 87 uh, to 81. That was actually a remark. I'm going to say it this way. When I came to Southern, there was this big issue of should you take some in one area, like your, your expertise area, and then take something like a New Testament. I took Henson, Leonard, and Sheridan all in history, and I never regretted it. It's a nice way of saying that when these four were here, Henson, Leonard, Allen, and Smith, that's the last heyday at Southern Seminary, and students who went through here just never regretted it. It's okay. Dr. Smith served as tutor in church history and Christian spirituality at South Wales Baptist College, an honorary lecturer in the School of History, Archaeology, and Religion at Cardiff University from 1991 to 2018. During that time from 93 to 2018, she also served as pastor of Orchard Place Baptist Church in Neath, Wales. She currently serves as honorary senior research fellow uh, at Cardiff. And her areas are similar to Lloyd, but shows you how this legacy can just take uh, rivers and streams in different directions. But uh, over in England, she also has focused on Baptist history, like Lloyd here, but more on English Baptist history. She too has focused on the history of spirituality and spiritual practice. She also has focus on issues of nonconformity and women in, in the 18th and 19th century. She is the current editor of the Baptist Quarterly, all of those of us who know Baptist history are quite aware of her work uh, with that. Her, we're looking forward to a PowerPoint. Uh, I will say that the first time I ever heard of Evelyn Underhill, it was in a class with uh, Dr. Henson, uh, English spiritual writer. I guess you can tell us whether she flirted with Catholicism or not. Uh, but nevertheless, we, her famous book, 1911, on mysticism, we look forward to Dr. Smith's presentation tonight. Well, thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here and to share this time. My thanks to the committee who organized all of this and who invited me to come and share in it. Um, when I went to Wales, when Paul and I moved um, to Wales, I took with me two photographs that uh, were made at the very last uh, convocation service before, um, before we moved. And uh, those photographs stayed in my office up on a shelf where I could see them uh, for 27 years. I did dust occasionally, but that's what <laughs> stayed up there. And one was of the church history department, and I think I sent Glenn a copy of that, and we said we'd have to take another one tonight uh, to re replace that. And the other was a picture that I got in the hallway of Pat Bailey and Diana Garland, and um, uh, special people. Um, I, if I'd had room in my office, I could have put loads and loads of photographs of people who um, were so important to me and to Paul um, during our time here. We were members of Crescent Hill uh, during that time, and um, so it was our first church after we um, married, and uh, we were both grateful to, uh, to be here. I'm glad Lloyd talked a little bit about spiritual direction, spiritual guidance. You'll notice that I've called it as spiritual guide because I too remember Glenn saying about <laughs> spiritual directors. Um, 
I think you'll see, as we talk about um, Evelyn Underhill, if I say Evelyn Underhill, you'll understand that in Britain, my first landlady was Evelyn. <laughs> and it's a British thing. So if I come out with something and you think, what? Um, that's, that's what it is. Um, she, I think you'll see that she was very much um, a spiritual guide as friend. And uh, so that's what we'll think about now. E Evelyn Underhill um, as spiritual guide. Reporting her death in 1941, the London Times claimed that Evelyn Underhill was one of the leading writers on religious mysticism and that the mystics could not have found a more painstaking or understanding champion than Miss Underhill. The author of 39 books and more than 300 essays and reviews, the description of Underhill as an understanding champion of the mystical tradition is a fitting one. Among her most significant publications was the title of the book, Mysticism, a Study of the Nature and Development of Man's Spiritual Consciousness. First published in 1911, by 1940, a year before her death, it had already reached its 13th edition. Although she wrote about the mystical way, for Underhill, the spiritual life was not to be equated with some otherworldly experience, nor was it measured by church attendance. Rather, the spiritual life was a life itself lived in every aspect in obedience to Christ. Indeed, Underhill was insistent that, as she put it, the spiritual life does not begin in an arrogant attempt at some peculiar kind of otherworldliness, a rejection of ordinary experience. It begins in the humble recognition that human things can be very holy, full of God. Underhill, of course, was not alone in her interest in religious experience. The 19th century Anglo-Catholic revival with its emphasis on holiness and sacramental mystery, as well as the growing field of psychology, had led to a burgeoning interest in the nature of religious experience among philosophers and theologians. By the turn of the 20th century, William Ng, or I think over here you say Ing, but um, Ing in Britain, was invited to give the Bampton Lecture in Oxford in 1899 on Christian mysticism. Harvard philosopher William James gave the prestigious Gifford Lectures at Edinburgh University in 1902 on the varieties of religious experience. Likewise, there was the work of Baron Friedrich von Hugel, uh, The Mystical Element of Religion, and he wrote that in 1908. It was von Hugel, of course, who served as a spiritual guide to Underhill, both informally from the time she read his work on mysticism and later more formally from 1921 until his death in 1925. It would be difficult to overestimate the influence of von Hugel on Underhill. When he died, she wrote to Dom John Chapman, I owe him, Van Hugel, my whole spiritual life. And there would have been more of it than it is if I had been more courageous and stern with myself and followed his directions more thoroughly. A man of genuine humility and prayer, von Hugel was an able theologian and an apologist for the Christian faith. Although he never taught in university through his published works, but especially perhaps through his extensive letter writing, he influenced many Christian seekers in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. A Roman Catholic, he had what the Quaker Douglas Steer, one of Glenn's friends, described as a rare, astonishing gift for friendship. 
Given his wide range of European contacts, as well as the fact that von Hugel's father was Austrian and his mother was Scottish, and that he lived all of his adult life in England, Steer humorously suggested that von Hugel was himself a kind of ecumenical movement. Writing about von Hugel's life in the London Guardian, the newspaper, um, well, you know what it is, shortly after his death in 1925, Underhill said that von Hugel was without exception the most influential religious personality of our time. Describing his approach to spirituality, Underhill claimed that it was rooted in a belief in the presence of God, or what he and later Underhill referred to as the reality of God in ordinary, day-to-day -day life. For him, the transcendental, the incarnational, and the institutional were all part of the rich totality of the spiritual life. As Underhill put it, von Hugel could hold together the pastoral and philosophic sides of the spiritual life and had a rock-like faith and a massive and lofty intellect. But he was also simply the lovable old man who cared for his dog and enjoyed laughing at jokes. Emphasizing his humanity and especially his ability to play down his own importance, Undershill spoke of him as homely and humble, claiming that to any small ailment or disappointment, the Baron would simply say, another little humiliation for me. What a good thing. The Baron's emphasis on Christian spirituality as transcendental, incarnational, and institutional became a focal point for Underhill's approach to the spiritual life. Indeed, reflecting on von Hugel's influence on Underhill, Douglas Steer claimed that after von Hugel's death, there emerged a new orientation in Underhill's life and writing, and that from this time, her own guidance of souls, her increasing service as a retreat leader, and her books and letters take on a new tone and focus. What she learned for herself from von Hugel's direction, she gave costingly and with moving abandon to others. After a brief overview of Underhill's life, I want to explore with you some of um, her advice, three aspects of the spiritual life as she saw it. Looking at first the importance of tradition Secondly, at a focus on Christ and what she's called a stern choice of discipleship. And thirdly, a desire for holiness in the midst of life. So first, um, a brief biographical sketch. Born in 1875 in Wolverhampton in the West Midlands of England to Arthur, later Sir Arthur Underhill, and his wife, Alice Lucy Ironmonger, Evelyn's early education took place at home. Then for three years, she attended a private school for girls, Sandgate House in Folkestone. Growing up as an only child, she enjoyed travel with her parents and developed a special love of art, literature, and languages, becoming competent in French, Latin, and Italian. She also spent many hours yachting, which was one of her father's favorite pastimes, and she gained a master mariner's qualification. And there's a picture of Evelyn on the yacht with her father and mother as a young girl. She later attended King's College for Women in London, but she never formally studied theology or philosophy. She had no formal training in those subjects. Underhill's parents were not regular churchgoers. As Evelyn put it later, 
She was not brought up to religion. However, while attending Sandgate House, when she was 16, she was confirmed at Christ Church, Folkestone, confirmed in the Anglican Church. At this point, however, she claimed later that she held a view of religion which stressed beauty and nature and led to an understanding of infinite love that guided the universe. The universe. She loved books and from an early age wanted to be an author. Her interest in literature also led her to become proficient at book binding. Her first book, A Bar Lamb's Ballad Book, was published in 1902. It was a book of poetry. In 1904, she published a novel entitled The Gray World, which explored the mystery of the seen and the unseen and emphasized the idea of searching for a world beyond which led to beauty. It has been suggested that the gray world was perhaps an early attempt to reflect philosophically on the meaning and purpose of life. And in many ways, it may be seen as yet another step on her journey of faith. Looking back on her move toward Christianity, she suggested that she could see that there was a sort of steady progress. She wrote this, philosophy brought me round to an intelligent and irresponsible sort of theism, which I enjoyed thoroughly, but which did not last long. Gradually, she said, the net closed in on me and I was driven nearer and nearer to Christianity. The publication of Underhill's novels brought her in contact with a number of people who would influence her on her spiritual journey. Among them were J.A. Herbert, who was keeper of the manuscripts at, Brit at the British Library, and his wife Alice, who was a novelist. They were Roman Catholics. Ethel Ross Barker, was the daughter of the canon at St. Paul's Cathedral, and she later became a Roman Catholic. She was a close friend of Evelyn Underhill. In fact, it was at the invitation of Barker that in February 1907, Underhill went to spend a weekend at a Franciscan convent, and it was there that she claimed I was converted, quite suddenly, once and for all, by an overpowering vision which had no specifically Christian elements, but yet convinced me that the Catholic religion was true. By Catholic, of course, Underhill meant Roman Catholic, and this caused her great difficulty. In 1906, Underhill and Hubert Stuart Moore had announced their plans to marry. Moore was six years older and, like her father, a barrister. They had been friends since childhood. Moore and his father were yachtsmen. So over the years, the two families had spent a great deal of leisure time together. Moore, however, did not share her interest in religion. He was unhappy about her decision to join the Catholic Church, and with their wedding approaching, he insisted that she should put off her final decision for at least six months. Unhappily, she agreed to do so, not just because of his disapproval, but also because of her inability to support the Pope's stand on modernism. It's right at that time when the Pope came out with a very strong stand against those things that the church considered to be um, out of bounds, really, as signs of modernism in the world. Um, that's a picture in 1907 of their um, wedding. As Underhill agonized over what she should do, 
Dana Green, her biographer, one of her many biographers, has suggested that Underhill found herself in a borderland. At the time, she did not feel that she could join the Anglican Church, and yet she did not feel that as a Christian, she was really part of the Anglican Communion. Eventually, she would settle in the Anglo-Catholic wing of the Anglican Church, though the process that took her there was very long and very painful for her. Yet it was this borderland, and I, I love that phrase because I think we can all probably identify with what it's like to be um, in, a, in a borderland, or what we sometimes call a place of liminality, um, where we're unsure and uncertain. Um, this was a place of growth, uh, which it so often is, I think, um, in the spiritual life. As she struggled to know how to be obedient to God, she began to study the inner life. And reading the works of the saints of the church, she began to collect materials which would later find their way into her first book on Christian mysticism. In a lecture marking the centenary of Underhill's birth, A.M. Alchin claimed that Evelyn Underhill was a considerable pioneer as she broke some of the traditional gender boundaries of the day. Notably, even though she had little formal education herself, she was one of the first women to lecture in theology in a university in Britain. When she was invited to give the Upton Lecture at Manchester College in Oxford in 1921, she went on to conduct retreats and not, they were retreats where uh, clergy were invited and she was the retreat leader for clergy, something quite unheard of in that day. Um, she spoke at conferences where she shared the platform with church leaders. In September 1935, for example, she spoke at the 65th World Congress at Bournemouth, and she was honored by King's College London with an honorary fellowship in 1913, later made a fellow in 1927. She was given an honorary doctorate by Aberdeen University in 1939. Yet while Underhill may have broken new ground as a 20th century woman writing in the area of mystical theology, she could not by any means be described as a precursor to the modern feminist movement. She was not the type to march with suffragists or lobby for women in parliament. Moreover, while she may have shared the platform with archbishops and bishops and priests, she spoke against women serving as priest. In 1932, at a conference called by the Council for Women's Church Work, she claimed this, I am opposed to the giving of the priesthood to women for many reasons and chiefly because I feel that so complete a break with Catholic tradition cannot be made save by the consent of a united Christendom any local or national church which, which makes it will drop at once to the level of an eccentric sect. Tellingly, I, I'm glad that didn't happen. <laughs> Tellingly, she went on to claim that she supported women in ministry when it was rooted and grounded in lives of real simplicity and self-abandonment and believed that this must be conducive to the well-being and enriching of the church's life. Underhill's comments reflect the social structures and attitudes of many people of that day. Now it might be suggest that the emphasis on self-surrender in organized religion is at times, or could be construed as, a social construct which has been used as a means of control. Yet it is also true that kenosis, or this self-emptying, may be understood as a real reflection of discipleship 
for men and women and need not be associated with the loss of life, but with a way of discovering life. Certainly for Underhill, the call to self-abandonment was not just for women, it was for men and women. Indeed, this was a genuine expression of devotion to Christ. As she put it, it was part of the stern choice required of all Christian believers. Still, I think it must be said that it is evident that throughout her life, Evelyn Underhill conformed to the social patterns and customs expected of her class in 20th century London. In many respects, and I think this is one reason why I find her writing so um, fascinating and so interesting, in many respects, she was like other early 20th century women of her social class and status. She had domestic servants to help in her home. She socialized with friends and entertained guests. She enjoyed yachting and she adored her cats. That's one little strike against her as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> um, she went every afternoon to have tea with her mother and they made yearly visits onto the continent on holiday. In other words, she enjoyed many of the privileges of her particular status in life. And yet, I want to say <laughs> that she also possessed a deep longing, a deep desire to know or to be known by God or as she put it, somehow to discover more of the reality of God. It was a long longing for life and not simply a longing for life for herself, but she wanted it for others too. As she sought to give herself more fully to God, she turned to the study of the spiritual classics and then sought the spiritual counsel of others. In particular, as already noted, Baron uh, Friedrich von Hugel became a trusted spiritual guide. In turn, Underhill would become a spiritual guide to others. Attention will now be given to these three themes in her, oh, that's just a, a picture of her, uh, at Pleshi, one of the, the retreat center that she went to. Um, three themes that we will look at briefly uh, in her spiritual advice to others. First, something I think sometimes today is seen as a, not a very nice word, tradition, the importance of tradition. Although Underhill was initially quite skeptical of the institutional church, she came to believe that spirituality must be rooted in tradition. That is to say that she felt both word and sacrament must be at the heart of the spiritual life. In a book entitled, The School of Charity, Meditations on the Christian Creed, it was written as a Lenten book, a book for Lent in 1934. Underhill reflected on the Nicene Creed. In it, she insisted that while some Christians tend to ignore the fact that with hardly any exception, the great, greatest masters of the spiritual life speak to us from within the church. As she puts it, they tell us, because of their own vivid sense of God, what full life within the church really means and can be. And they do not invite us to contract out of it. For Underhill, participation in the tradition of the church also meant participation in the richness of the sacramental life. This meant regular participation in worship, and especially the Eucharist or the Lord's Supper. This appreciation for doctrine and the traditions of the church 
was not something that Underhill had immediately embraced. In fact, when she turned to von Hugel for spiritual guidance in 1921, she apparently realized that somehow she had a strong aversion to the institutional life of the church, which had led her to emphasize the mystical and the experiential element of religion over the historical and sacramental side. Apparently, von Hugel realized it too and wrote to her that he had been hoping and praying that she would recover the institutional element. And he had been delighted to hear that in preparing the addresses for Manchester College, Oxford, she had come out strongly and self-committingly for tradition, for the traditional, institutional, and sacramental religion. Yet knowing the intensity of Underhill's character, he warned her against sharp, focusing too sharply on institutional practices. Because he realized, perhaps he realized, how easy it is to supplant genuine devotion with the kind of religiosity of simply attending worship services. Hence, in addition to setting time limits on her daily private prayer, he suggested that she should set herself a pattern of one church service on a Sunday, preferably the early communion at her own Anglican church, and a midweek visit to a service in a convent, which was at a well, house well known to her. He did not mean empty liturgy, of course, but the sort of practice that nurtured and deepened a relationship with God. Underhill must have taken on board how regular participation in the sacraments of the church may prepare a person to be more aware of the sacramental nature of the whole of life. For she later counseled someone else. Now as to institutionalism. When I said that I desired for you a more sacramental type of religion, the last thing I meant was music, beauty, and liturgy. By all means, have a taste of these from time to time if they appeal to you, but please recognize them clearly for what they are, the chocolate creams of religion. <laughs> By sacramentalism, she wrote, I mean the humble acceptance of grace through the medium of things. God coming into our souls by means of the humblest accidents, the intermingling of the spirit and sense. What Underhill came to realize and was advising others is that worship and above all the sacraments of the church are not to be approached as a series of religious acts to be fulfilled. Rather, regular participation in those acts serve as a reminder of the nearness of God in many ways throughout life, as well as urging one of her correspondents to make it a rule to go to communion once a week, or at least once a fortnight. She likewise felt that certain types of worship services were to be avoided. She wrote, about church going, I am quite of your opinion. I should never dream of going to a cheerful, hearty evensong or shouting hymns by ways of expressing my devotion. I do not feel that it's anyone's duty to do so unless that sort of thing is a natural act of worship to them. I do think it is right and necessary to attend a celebration every Sunday, but anything beyond that seems to be a matter of individual piety, which one is at liberty to settle for oneself. Part of focusing on tradition, according to Underhill, was also to realize that meditation on scripture and prayer were central to devotion. 
She claimed that the true source books of Christian spirituality were the Psalter and the New Testament. Of course, she also honored the tradition of the church by drawing from spiritual writers across the centuries. The prayer books that she used when she led retreats are filled with prayers by men and women, pastors and poets across the ages from many, many different places around the world. Likewise, in her letters to others, she often suggested reading the works of some of the spiritual writers. She suggested to one the imitation of Christ or St. Teresa's way of perfection. But humorously, on one occasion, she cautioned, much of the cloud, meaning the cloud of unknowing, much of the cloud is beyond most of us. It is one of the books that keep on and on revealing new depths. While Underhill's own approach to spirituality was from an Anglo-Catholic perspective, her emphasis on tradition was not narrow or limited to her own experience. Like her friend and mentor, Von Hugel, she believed that the church was wider than any denomination or group. Moreover, she discovered that a genuine rootedness in tradition would lead to openness to others as well. She delighted in the growing ecumenism in Britain and wrote to a friend in 1924, last Thursday evening was such a joy. We had a great meeting at the Albert Hall for my Christian citizenship conference and it was splendid packed right up to the roof with people, and everyone so keen, and a lovely spirit everywhere. And we had Romans and nonconformists speaking too, and all sitting happily on the platform. One wonders what, what, you know, what might have been. Happily on the platform, and treating each other's beliefs with reverence. I did really feel the whole thing was a triumph for the spirit of Christ. So tradition and the importance of it. The next aspect that I want to look at briefly is discipleship or a stern choice for Christ. In addition to encouraging um, Underhill to focus on what might be called the institutional side of the Christian faith, Von Hugel also suggested that Underhill's approach to Christian spirituality seemed more theocentric than Christocentric. While she had admitted, committed herself to God, by her own admission, she did not know what it meant to have a personal experience with the Lord. Underhill realized this and later explained to a friend how the Baron had helped her. She wrote, until about five years ago, I never had any personal experience of our Lord. I didn't know what it meant. Somehow by his, von Hugel's prayers or something, he compelled me to experience Christ. It took about four months it was like watching the sun rise very slowly. And then suddenly, one knew what it was. The realization of personally knowing a living Lord led Unhill to contemplate what it means to follow a suffering Savior. For her, this meant, as she put it, to think of the cross is to think of life. It was also to think of what it means to give and to love sacrificially. Reflecting on the inner life and the way of the cross, she claimed that suffering love was simply part of the Christian life. She wrote, there is a hard and costly element, a deep seriousness a crucial choice in all genuine religion of which the New Testament warns us on every page. And this is more plain to us as we leave its surface and penetrate its solemn deeps. 
There we find a suffering and love so closely together that we cannot wrench them apart. And if we try to do so, the love is maimed in the process, loses its creative power, and the suffering remains, but without its aureole of willing sacrifice. This emphasis on personal relationship with the suffering Christ is at the heart of Christian faith and was central to the guidance that Underhill gave to others. On one occasion, a friend had obviously chided Underhill for speaking so openly about the cross as a way of struggle and difficulty. Underhill responded with characteristic bluntness, Yes, I do think all kinds of pain and struggle and all uneasy things done with effort are or can be what I mean by the way of the cross. All people who live honestly, intensely, and sincerely are treading it in spite of themselves. But it is better to know what one is about. I suppose taken alone, it does seem rather an austere view of the universe but I am sick of feather bed and dry champagne type of religion, aren't you? <laughs> One of my favorite quotes from uh, <laughs> um, That is not having life more abundantly, anyhow. She meant, of course, that genuine faith in Christ is demanding, and it requires a deliberate choice, not just once but over and over. For her to make the choice meant that everything else had to be put to one side. One must be centered. To a friend she wrote directly, I do not think that you have ever made the cross the center of your life, really. I do not know what you have made the center, but it looks as though it can't be that. And you have got to, you know, nothing else will do. Of course, Underhill realized how discouraged some Christians could become in trying to live a life for God and with God. She herself had experienced a kind of spiritual dryness Nevertheless, she believed that the only way was to abandon self and focus on the cross. She wrote, It is useless to talk in a large, vague way about the love of God. Here is, it is to point to the insertion in the world of people, in action, example, and, and demand. Every Christian is required to be an instrument of God's rescuing action, and his power will not be exerted through us except at considerable cost to ourselves. So I could go on and on with discipleship, but um, the final point, holiness in the midst of life. In a series of talks for the BBC radio in 1936, Underhill tried to describe for listeners the spiritual life. From the outset, she said that it was her objective to make it clear that Christian faith was not an intense form of otherworldliness, remote from the common ways and incompatible with the common life, but rather as the heart of all real religion and therefore a vital concern to ordinary men and women. Admitting that the phrase, the spiritual life, was dangerously ambiguous, Underhill tried to point out that she was not thinking about an examination of individualist faith. This was not, she said, as someone might think, a phrase referring to, quote, the life of my own inside. Rather, she tried to show how the spiritual life from a Christian perspective refers to, and I quote, 
a life in which all we do comes from the center, where we are anchored in God, a life soaked through and through by a sense of his reality and claim and self-given to the great movement of his will. Speaking about the spiritual life as communion with God and cooperation with God, she stressed that it's not about standing aloof from life. Rather, it embraces all of life and insisted that what is required is not necessarily a great deal of time devoted to what we regard as spiritual things, but rather a constant offering of our wills to God so that the practical duties, which fill most of our days, can become part of his order and be given spiritual worth. Holiness of life, in other words, was not simply about reading the Bible or praying or going to worship <laughs> services, nor was it about withdrawal from the world. Rather, like many other Christian spiritual writers, Underhill believed that there is no part of life that is free from God. Everything that we do should be devoted to God. Over and over in her letters to others, she stressed the need to turn out from self. Our pride, she said, must have winter weather. She wrote and warned someone else of trying to get so caught up in living a religious life that they miss the fact that God is present with us always. Something I can remember Glenn talking about often in class, the presence of, of God. Um, she wrote to one person, oh, do turn and do, and oh, do turn to and do and be things for and to your fellow creatures a bit. Devote yourself to that. Don't be afraid of surface interest. Christ will be with you in those sorts of surface interest if they are wholeheartedly undertaken for his sake and not for your own soul's sake. In another letter she wrote, I hope you're going to get hold of a little personal work amongst the poor when you can. Go out as much as you can and enter into the interest of others, however twaddly, that's a good British uh, phrase. <laughs> I'll explain later what twaddly, it's a bit difficult, but twaddly. Um, they are all part of life. Remember, and life for you is divine. It seems evident that holiness of life was never a matter of shutting oneself away from others, but should always lead to reaching out and sharing with others. This was the outworking of the Christian faith. It was, to use the title of one of her books, Practical Mysticism. Not to withdraw from others or to make a public spectacle of religiosity, but to let others see the love of Christ. On one occasion, Underhill wrote to a friend who had become very discouraged as she was teaching a girl's Bible class. And her advice was not to attempt intellectual teaching. <laughs> but to build relationships with them and to let them see Christ in her. She wrote, don't be depressed about your girl's Bible class. Of course, they have not an elementary sense of religion. Not 1% of the population have at their age and only a smallish portion of the population at any age. The main thing is in this sort of work that you should make them like you and that you should make it perfectly clear to them that you believe absolutely in your religion and you care intensely for it. You will not make them grasp religion now because they do not feel any need of it. 
but sometime a crisis will come in their lives and they will either accept or reject religion. Then the memory of your teaching or rather the personality of the teacher who represented Christianity to them will become of paramount importance to them. In 1924, she led a retreat which she gave for a group of social workers. I didn't know Pat Bailey was going to be here tonight. Um, a group of social workers and charitable volunteers doing work in the docklands of London, a very poor area in London. And she asked the question, what is sanctity? What is holiness? And re responded, just the perfection of our love, its growth toward God and others. The more we love, the better our work. Even if we are only doorkeepers in the house of God, the more likely we are to attract others to the door. And just a few concluding remarks. Reflecting on the life of Evelyn Underhill, Annis Callahan suggested that as a spiritual guide, Underhill was a pathfinder for our way to God. It is a good description. As she read and reflected on the Christian mystical tradition, and with the encouragement of friends and guides such as Baron Friedrich von Hugel, Underhill discovered for herself the meaning of the reality of God's presence. While she spent her life trying to think about the mystical way, she was sure, as she put it on one occasion, that the spiritual life is not a peculiar or extreme form of piety. Rather, it is about a life, uh, living a life dedicated to God and realizing that there is no place out of God's reach. She was, of course, a practical guide, realizing that not all people had the time or opportunity to devote to what we might be regarded or we might regard as spiritual things. She claimed that what is needed is simply the constant offering of our wills to God so that practical duties, which fill most of our day, may become part of God's order and be given spiritual worth. She was adamant in her writing that true Christian faith must be lived out daily with an awareness of the reality of God in the whole of life. Of course, in order to become aware of divine reality, Christians need to be aware of tradition, give themselves to Christ, and make the stern choice for discipleship. She knew that the Christian way was often difficult, that there could be times when in our inner lives we might experience weariness, a sense of desolation, humiliating falls, as she put it, and a sense of deprivation. Little wonder, she wrote, that the Christian must be sturdy about it, fit for all weathers and indifferent to his or her interior ups and downs. Comfort and safety first must give pla to a place to courage and love if we are to become, as we should be, the traveling agents of divine charity. As Underhill discovered from her study of the mystical writers, there can be no separation between the sacred and the secular. The mystical way is the way of love or charity in life. And it should always find expression in practical ways in the care for others. After all, the spiritual life is not something separate from life, but rather it is life itself.
I'm going to thank Dr. Smith for the lecture. So much there to talk about. Um, just as we did before dinner, we really would like for you to write some questions on the small pieces of paper we gave you so we could actually read the questions in the microphone as it's being taped. If you don't have those little three by five cards, as long as I can read it, write it on the green napkins. Uh, <laughs> but if we'd love to have some questions, we have a few moments to do that. I'm going to ask the first question about that. So it'll give some folks time uh, to write questions. I know she's not uh, in terms of time at, this, at, at the same juncture, but in the late 19th century in England, it was the Keswick movement on holiness. Uh, guess that was more focused on individual, but uh, the language of uh, having separate spiritual experiences for spiritual power uh, comes out of the Keswick movement. And I was wondering if she ever had any opportunity or occasion to dialogue with Keswick or maybe react against it or anything like that. Yeah. Um, I can't recall any particular reference to the Keswick movement and all that I have read, although she did engage with, you know, many, many writers and many, many different um, people in one letter, you know, she um, mentioned reading the church at the crossroads, you know, the sort of um, Baptist book. So she had, she read widely, but I don't re recall she uh, engaged with Orthodox um, leaders and, and different ones. She was very interested in thinking about that, but I don't, I don't, I can't recall any time when she actually mentioned the Keswick movement. Do we have some questions you'd like to pass up to me? I'll come and get them. Glenn? Yeah. Uh, Frank, Glenn Pates, that there was uh, more of a yeah. that she was confirmed. Yeah. She, she, she struggled to find the balance, but I think you're right, Glenn. Um, in a sense, m much of the advice that she had had from the Baron you, you find that she incorporated that in advice um, to others. And he did encourage her to go. She went once a week or twice a week into the slums uh, visiting. And while she was there, she met a woman called Laura Rose, who became a very good friend of, of hers. Um, and... Uh, the way the way they realized they had a connection. Apparently, she was visiting this woman, and um, said, "What do you like to read?" And she told her that she liked to read Saint John of the Cross, and they had a co connection through. They were both, um, you know, interested in the spiritual classics. But I think that is why she also said to people later. Um, realizing, especially in the radio talks, she realized that not everyone has the time. She, she was thinking of Laura Rose in the looking after her children, struggling to do the cooking and the cleaning and the, all that she had to do. And hence why she said to people, it is possible to um, find God in whatever it is that we we're doing, but you're absolutely right, in, and I didn't incorporate all of that here, but at the beginning, she was far too academic. You know, she was reading and studying and so on, and um, the Baron did tell her, you know, you need to get out, and, uh, and hence she became more, more balanced, I think. So. Okay, we've got three good ones here. Uh, the first one. Uh, if I can't answer it, I'm going to come up with it. We can get it. He's got his own mic now. Yeah, I'll let Glenn take over. Did she respond to the modernist challenge or Virginia Woolf? Number one. Did she respond to the modernist challenge? That's what that's what my eyes are reading here. Is that right? She really she really struggled over the modernist challenge, which is why she never did. Um, Go, you know, go into the Catholic Church. She never, I mean, I think she would have probably, even against her husband's wishes, I think she might have, but she said that she felt intellectually she couldn't. Now, many of her Catholic friends said, 
you know, you don't have to accept it in that way. That's not entirely true. You, you know, it's, um, but um, she, she didn't go to, into the Catholic Church because of that. You know, she felt that intellectually she could not embrace um, the church as it was at that time, but still had loads of friends and, and was part of the Anglo-Catholic wing of the church, what, what, what we would say, in, uh, obviously in the Anglican church, high, she was in a high Anglican uh, tradition, the Anglo-Catholic tradition. Hey, thanks for this, whoever did this, I like it. <laughs> did she have any mystical experiences herself? Um, the only thing she really wrote about was that experience where she said, I was converted um, she never really explained it. Um, the, some people debate, I've read articles where people debate, was she a mystic or not? Or was she simply writing about the mystical tradition? Um, she does say in one place, and, and I, I wonder actually if we know all of her experience, because she says in one of her letters to someone, don't talk so much about your experience. She says to him, it cheapens it. She, she does. She said, it cheapens it. it. Don't go around feeling that you've got to um, you know, talk about it so much. Some things need to simply be um, kept and held precious and holy. So the answer to it is that she doesn't write about loads of mystical experiences, but my guess is that in her prayer and meditation, she had, she, perhaps she wouldn't have called them mystical experience, but because you see for her, mysticism was about the reality of God's presence. So she had experiences where she knew the reality of, um, of God's presence. And that was the experience, not some, you know, seeing something or whatever. I'll tell you a story. Um, I had in my church in Wales um, um, a man who had worked for 40 years in the mines. And he showed me a shovel one day, and it was only about that short because I won't get down into it, but he was on one knee shoveling over his, over his shoulder. Okay. And I was visiting him one, one day, and he'd had lots of trouble in his life in many ways. And uh, he was in poor health and his wife had died and um, they had lost a child. And um, I'll never forget it. He had a gruff voice like this. And he always would talk to me, pastor. Always call me pastor. It's the reality of God, see? The reality of God. Yes, Gwen, I said, it is. And if you ask me if he had had mystical experiences, <laughs> the reality of God, he knew it for himself. And I think, I think in a strange way, I think that's what Underhill was trying to get at. You know, don't go around simply looking for something that you can then talk about. <laughs> You know it in the in the day to day um, life. Sorry, I got to preaching there. I'm so sorry. No, it's, that's good. Um, I'm gonna have to take notes on this one. I'm getting ready to do some more work on Ewan Mullins myself. But the question is, do you think that Underhill influenced Ewan Mullins' axioms in any way? And if so. Could you discuss how this might have influenced Baptists? I have no idea. Glenn, do you, could you? <laughs> Glenn, yeah, I don't, th I don't think so, actually. <laughs> yeah. no, no. I have no idea is the answer. <laughs> okay. Um, I, I will tell you that if it did, Mullins is uh, the biography by his spouse. Uh, he said this old competency phrase came to him just out of the blue, which I don't buy, but that's what he said. It might have helped her if she had to have some experience of African-American spirituality, just like Dietrich Bonhoeffer came, you know, he, went, he attended a, uh, 
short it was. Carl, I don't know. Have a seat. 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 No, we are limited by our cultural upbringing, the background. Uh, we Southerners are all limited by being part of Southern culture, being deeply influenced by it. In the same way, she was very deeply influenced by her culture. Uh, Von Hugel, in a way, helped that he he provided the challenge to the cult. I've got one more, so we have another minute if somebody else would like to give me one. This is very similar to the one, Dr. Smith, that you've already answered, um, but, but I'm going to go ahead and do it to, to honor the fact that, that you gave it. But it shows the importance that people, uh, when we hear these stories, uh, attach to this experience we have ourselves and what how do we describe the experience? So uh, the question was, uh, you said she took about four months to finally have a personal encounter or experience with the Lord. Did she expand on that experience? I think you've already answered that. The second one, what did she hear or see or feel? So let me just tweak that and go, if she didn't talk too much about herself, did she ever do that in the abstract about seeing and hearing and no. feeling? Just didn't do it? No, okay. no. Um, she, she, I don't know if it was her particular personality or whatever, but she didn't, in her letters, she didn't go into, she didn't talk a lot about her, about herself. Um, except occasionally, and I always thought this was, this was um, quite important, she would point out where she had missed something in the past herself. <laughs> and she would, you know, she said in one of her letters, that someone had told her one time that she didn't see Christ in others. And she wrote, it made me very mad at the time. <laughs> and she said, and later I realized it was true. So she was, she was willing to not only to use what she had learned um, on her own spiritual journey, but also to say, quite honestly, um, you know, how she had, how she had grown. I, th I thought that was a, a wonderful sort of um, point. Uh, not a perfect person, not, you know, and, but to come back to Lloyd's point, she did use very much friendship as a way of, uh, she wrote to people as friends, sometimes kind of really telling them off, you know, enough of that, you know, you, you know straighten up, you know. But um, willing, not willing to share about her own personal religious experience, unless I guess she felt it might help them. When, when she was writing to the person about, which I thought was lovely, it was a long letter about her discouragement with the... Um, girls Bible class, we've all been there. Um, um, she, she said at the end, you know, I'm not very good at this, <laughs> you know, um, but you are, um, and, and, you know, keep at it sort of thing, so. Yes, sir, Dr. Holbrook. Uh, one comment, she referred to she referred to getting out into the Docklands. Uh -huh. Now, this I know is even pre-World War II, uh -huh. but uh, if you by chance have seen any of the series called Midwife, uh, the early part of that series yeah. is right in post-World War yeah. II, yeah. and you get some sense of, yeah. boy, the rough. Oh, it was. I mean, it was awful. Yeah. And, uh, and she's done three books on that. Uh -huh. The first one, of course, is about that uh -huh. time. The second one is the workhouses. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third one uh, goes into the further development of the midwives. But, but uh, you get some sense of what she's talking yeah. about. I mean, she's talking about serious stuff. And it, it was like, you know, remember, <laughs> Going to worship is that's the chocolate creams of religion. You know, you know to, to have any real understanding of sacrificial love and the reality of God and 
embracing God in real life. She wasn't simply suggesting, you know, that we, you know, go to church or whatever. That was important. Tradition, which I, I, I want to emphasize that, it was very important. Not something to be put to one side, but in a balanced spirituality, a balanced relationship, there has to be also that constant search, not in the easy places, but in the difficult places. Um, and she encouraged people to, um, you know, to do that. So, thank you very much. Let's give her another hand.